to my right, we have the man called Stuart Hawks, all the way from London. He's um, a mastering engineer at uh, a thing called Metropolis Mastering, um, also a known studio. a studio, <laughs> also known as um, the Powerhouse, right? That's right, yeah. And yeah, he will have a little talk about this thing called mastering, which is somewhere between religion and physics, <laughs> right? Somewhere, yeah. Okay, and um, a black art, a, bla a black black magic. Black magic. And I would like to to have this um, lecture quite open. So if you have any questions throughout our talk, or things you want to know, please ask them instead of waiting till the end. So maybe yeah, to start, you can give a little introduction about how you got into the thing. I mean the cl the classic. Um, way of getting into a master studio is as a teapot boy, right? It is, and that's how it indeed art is. Um, I think most people don't even know that mastering goes on um, in the recording process. Uh, and it was the case with myself that um, I left school, I was asked to leave school, um, didn't know you, what to do. You, you <laughs> set it on fire? or No, <laughs> no just general misbehaving. And... Uh, I, I was a drummer at the time and uh, loved hi-fi. It was my, my two big passions. And I thought, put the two together, I'd love to work in a recording studio. So um, I, I got a long list of recording studios, wrote off a CV, um, seeing if they got jobs as a runner or whatever, and then got a, a, a few back. One of them said, we've got an immediate vacancy. Um, come up, have an interview. I went along, got the job. Started on a Monday morning, turned up and walked into the first studio and thought, well, it looks just like a recording studio, but there's no sort of, you know, big desk, loads of buttons, big speakers, but, you know, where does the band sit? I couldn't understand what it was, and I was told it was mastering, and, um, you know, this was a, a stage in between the recording and the manufacturing, and uh, it was just pulling the whole project together, making um, the sound as, as, sound as good as it can, um, cutting then it was just lacquers and uh, for vinyl manufacturer and the cassette masters um, and that was it I started as a, as a tea boy in a, in a mastering place called Tape One which was at the time the sort of uh, the best place I would say or I would say in London that was doing mastering so I started the job by accident but, but you were actually looking for, for a job as an engineer right? So well, I just wanted to get involved with, with sound. And I think, you know, I loved music and I loved uh, performance of music. And, you know, this, it was great. And um, to me, it was, it was perfect because, you know, you get listened to whole tracks. You don't listen to just a snare beat for hours on end. Uh, you get to meet lots of new people. Um, and I get the sort of the, the final touch on, on projects. And it's great. And, you know, it was a bit of luck. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's been good. It's worked out and well. that was back in 1986. 86. Yeah. But just, just as CDs was coming on. Coming on. But, but maybe you could um, describe the difference between an engineer and a mastering uh, engineer. A, a mastering. Uh, yeah, because lots of I know a lot of people always mix that up. Well, I guess the main difference is an engineer will be looking at all the different elements within a track, um, whereas a mastering engineer will be looking at the whole track. I think that's the main difference between sound engineering um, and mastering. So it's just, it's looking at the whole thing rather than the elements within it and um, making, packaging that as an album, as a single, as a download, as a vinyl. Um, we do all the editing and uh, general assembly of master tapes. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit different to recording. And you, you just mentioned that the CD was just about to being established. That's when right, you yeah. So maybe you can talk a bit about what it was like getting rid of vinyl. Uh, we're still here. <laughs> um, it was uh, well, it was very confusing to a lot of people at the time. I mean, we had the the first all digital mastering desk, which um, was a prototype built by Neve, um, and we got that in. And it was it was so ahead of its time. We actually made a mistake and, and built this thing to work at 48 kilohertz, which is not where CD settled down at 44.1. They got it wrong, which meant we had to kind of upsample everything, master it, and then downsample everything. Um, and it was, it was kind of you know a bit of a mistake. People paid a lot of money to work in this room, though. 
even then, and this is in 86, 87, it was um, 185 pound an hour to work in this room, and it was always packed out. Um, I mean, even now, you know, that's about the price that master rooms go out now. So it's like the whole thing's kind of stood still from then on. Um, but it was, it was very expensive to produce all this machinery back then, of course, this new digital kit. And I remember the, um, the first ever CD burner when, when they rolled it into the studio, this Gotham audio, it was called, a great big archaic looking digital bit of kit. And it actually cost then about £40,000 for a CD burner. And, you know, now, I think it's sort of £40 you can buy yourself one. But we were all very excited about getting that and, you know, excited about the new formats and everything was being remastered and put on CD. You know, and I think there was very exciting times for uh, mastering and music in general with, you know, CD coming along. I think there was a lot of um, uh, energy around the music business. It was, um, you know, there's a lot more opportunity to sort of sell stuff. There's more money around. It was, it was a good time. Lively. Lively, yeah. But, and also then, in terms of mastering, <coughs> because it was a, a, a very expensive process, you needed an awful lot of money to buy all the equipment. I mean, for example, a cutting lathe was, they're about new, they're about £200,000. A what? £200,000 to buy one. <laughs> But what, what? A cutting lathe, a cut. Maybe you can explain oh, what sorry, it is to I'm someone. Jumping ahead, dealing with them every day. I think or, or is everybody knowing about the cutting thing? A, the cutting lathe for vinyl, basically. So you, you, know, you, you, you cut whatever you, um, you've mastered already. What happens now when you master for CD, um, once you've finished mastering the CD, you then cut from that mastered file onto vinyl. So you cut the master lacquer. And you do that on a cutting lathe, which were predominantly German built by Neumann. And uh, lucky they were, because they're still going strong. Um, yeah, that's a cutting lathe. But that was incredibly expensive then. Are, are they still being produced these days? No, no, no. They stopped making them in the 80s. So there will be a physical end to making vinyl one day? If no yeah, one I mean, you know, the lathes are wearing out. They're, they're more and more expensive to service. Um, but there's still quite a few about, and they're, they're lasting. I mean, it's incredible, really. You know, the, the, the youngest ones are eight, still 20 years old. So. And how would you describe mastering to someone on a plane next to you oh, if you gosh. get asked what you do for a living? It's best to say I'm a plumber or something. I think yeah. it's a bit more straightforward. But, but, uh, um, how, many, how many people here actually have been in a mastering studio? Oh, quite a lot. Quite a few. Did you, did you enjoy it? Was it, yeah? <laughs> Quite long. Or well, the process of doing it. Uh, it shouldn't be too long. I think on average I'd spend about half an hour on a track, maybe, maybe not even that long. But it's, um, normally once you, if you know the sort of music you're dealing with, you, you know, it's quite, if you get all the tracks in and it's, you've got all the files ready in front of you, you can kind of get through it quite, quite quickly. How long did you spend doing it then, do you know? Oh, right. so look. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's normally quite quick. I mean, we've started now, we charge by the track. I mean, normally, a lot of mastering is charged on time. But I think now, with um, budgetary sort of concerns, etc., people like to be charged per track. So that is the mastering's concession to all the labels going out of business? Well, you know, kind of, although, you know, there's still, still plenty about. But it, it just, it makes more sense. I think people get very confused now when you, they phone up and inquire about mastering. And you can't be completely clear about how much it's going to cost because you, you never know how involved the project is, um, how long it's going um, to take to master a 12-track album, for example. So people, you know, appreciate you charging it by the track as opposed to, Just saying, well, it's going to take approximately eight to 12 hours. You know, it's a bit ambiguous. Approximately. Approximately. And yeah, but maybe we're still on the plane next to that person. Oh, right, I'm still explaining about yeah, mastering. For, for all those people who haven't been at the mastering studio. Right, what is mastering? I suppose it's, to me, it's a kind of quality control to some degree. I think there's, um, th th there are times when I get tracks in and I, I put them on and literally I, I, I can't do anything to improve them. And, um, you know, it's a bit embarrassing, and no one likes to do that. But it does happen. It's, you know, I had, um, I remember I had a client a couple of years ago, a French guy, he used to bring loads of jazz albums to me. And then 
uh, he brought this album in, he came all the way from France with a bit of an entourage, and we sat down and listened to this album, and I literally couldn't do anything to it to improve it. You know, it was already loud, it sounded good, it was all balanced, and I just had to say, uh, you know, I can't change it, it sounds great, and he sort of went away, and I never saw him again. <laughs> and, and, and how often do you get something where you can't change anything, but it's not perfect? Um, I'd say th to not change anything, you can't improve it at all. Maybe one track in, in 50, I would say. And how many do you do in a year? In a year? God, you know, I was working this out recently, trying to. I think it was something like 17, 15 and 1,700 tracks a year, roughly based on... I work every other day. I think it was roughly 12 tracks, 14 tracks every other day. So quite a few. So yeah. and, and that's not a problem to work uh, through different tracks on a day from, from different artists or whatever? Oh, well, it can be, yeah. I mean, it's a bit difficult if you're going from, you know, drummer bass to jazz or something. You have to kind of, you know, have a bit of a break and sort of clear the palette. Um, but generally, as long as you don't get too carried away and turn it up too loud and you reference stuff, I mean, it's very important, um, I find, if you're getting stuck, if you're unsure, um, especially with clients in the room and they're not sure either, that they bring in their own stuff to reference it against so that everyone is sort of clear about the monitoring. Um, because, you know, I couldn't walk into a studio and start mastering on a, on a set of monitors that I've never worked on before. So, you know, it's a bit unfair, really, when clients turn up to just expect them to join in with me and give opinions on what I'm doing and say, you know, do you like it or not? Do you want me to change this? Try this? Um, because they're not familiar with, the, uh, with the, the, the monitoring that we're using. So, you know, it's quite important that... Um, I say to people, bring in reference CDs. If you want to try listening to something, get used to the speakers a bit. It, it really helps out. So you have to trust your engineer. My engineer? You, no, a client. Oh, client. Trust well, to some degree. Engineer. I mean, mastering normally is, um, is done on, a, for, on an approval basis. So if we've got an album, um, we'll go through, you know, we might spend, let's say, eight hours doing an album, and the, the client will go away with a, a CDR normally. Um, and listen to it on a, on a system that they know and understand so that you know, they can be sure about it and they can reference it. And If you're doing a hip-hop album, you know, they can play it next to other hip-hop albums and make sure the volume's there and the bass is there and it's, you know, it's comparable or better than what else is out there. Um, and that is you know, partly what's fueled things like the, the volume issues with CDs, that everyone's trying to get the one-upmanship against everyone else. So... People take their CD home that's been mastered. It's not quite as loud, or they want it to be louder than this, and you push it a bit more. I think there are a few questions, but... So can, can you comment uh, about the whole loudness wars thing, you know, and the way that everything is exactly that now? It seems like it's all just... Especially the pop stuff and the hip-hop kind of stuff, in that respect, it's... Can it get any louder, really? Like, it just seems like it's almost beyond... Yeah. the dynamic range and it just feels a bit... Well, the dynamic range is sort of getting gone. squashed. Yeah, and squashed. exactly. So um, and it is to do with what... Can I, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Um, it's not to... But I want to actually... About that, um, when I released my EP, I worked with two producers yeah. and they had two different looks on how to push, uh, push the tracks. So, and I work with a um, master studio called Cutting Room in Sweden. Do you yeah, know about yeah, them? Yeah, I've heard. Uh, they kind of know to well, push yeah. it, really. They're, they're in England too? I think there's one called the Cutting Room in England as well, but anyway, yeah. Okay. The thing was, um, one of the tracks, well, one of the producers wanted it to not be pushed at all, really. And one of the, the other, other one did. Yes. And I was kind of in between. So, and the thing was, I wanted the EP to sound as equal as possible. So, so I'm really, really interested in what you were saying there, because yeah. when I listen to some records, when it comes to Blur, for example, they don't push things at all. Well, some don't. I mean, it's, a part of it is down to confidence as well. You know, some people, they, they recognize that just because it's loud, it doesn't mean it's better. It's not going to sell any more records. It's just about everyone just wanting their record to be bigger and better, and therefore it's, well, sorry, therefore it is better, and it is possibly going to sell more or sound more impressive and therefore sell more. Um, I'm not sure if that really works, though. I'm not sure if, if there's any proof of that whatsoever. Um, but 
Well, the radios, I don't think it makes any difference. In fact, there's arguments to say, and we're trying to test this at Metropolis, where the, it's actually the quieter CDs that come across louder on the radio because of the Optimod compressors and things, the way they work. Um, it's hard to test it because you have to do proper broadcasts. And um, every radio station works in different ways, so there's no sort of continuity across all radio stations. So it's a bit of a difficult one to solve that. Um, but I'll deal with what you're saying first. I think it, it goes back to what I was just saying before the questions, is that everyone wants their record sound a little bit louder than everyone else's. And so it, it creeps up slowly. And so you end up with a standard which is ridiculously loud and distorted. But unless you're going to do something quieter and less dis distortion, um, it, it's going to sound less of a record in a way, people feel, because it's quieter. So it's hard to sort of get everyone to buy into that because it's a business, because record labels want it to sell. They want it to sound bigger and better, and producers want it to sound bigger and better. Everyone's just pushing and pushing. And to a degree, as a mastering engineer, we do get kind of blamed for it, I would say. But we don't, we hate it as well. And I, you know, I think all engineers or most mastering engineers would agree. But it's kind of the nature of the beast to some degree. And it's, it's hard to turn it back. If everyone just went, let's do it a bit 2 dB quieter, great. But it doesn't happen. And I don't know if you've been reading about this um, thing that's going on with the um, Metallica album. There's a very interesting sort of case study that um, Ted Jensen's mastered this. Metallica album, and there's, uh, it's so loud, there's a petition online at the moment to get it remastered because they thought it was a mastering, whereas it wasn't. It was so loud, it's distorting, and it's just completely unpleasant to listen to. Um, and, and who did this? Well, it was mastered by Ted Jensen. But he's a well-known mastering yeah, engineer? Yeah, he's a very, you know, very good mastering engineer over in, in New York. But, um, you know, he put, he was obviously quite annoyed that he was getting the finger pointed at him because he's gone online now and said, wrote this letter saying this is how the masters were delivered to him and he can't undo it once it's squashed and truncated and sounding nasty. As a mastering engineer, there's nothing you can do to undo that. So he's just, you know, put this onto CD essentially. It's Rick Rubin as a producer and I think it's kind of come from him and he doesn't really care. I well, I don't know if he doesn't care. I don't know how this is going to sort of pan out, but um, it's interesting, and it's, it's good to see that there's this petition going on, because it almost, hopefully, it will be the beginning of the end of this ridiculous volume thing. But, you know, again, who's so going who's gonna to be the one to go to the so quiet it's CD actually, first? It's actually a bit like being a hairdresser, and someone desperately wants a mullet, <laughs> and then you're accused <laughs> of giving him the mullet? Uh, <laughs> Oh, sure. <laughs> well, I suppose so, yeah. yeah. Well, it's like him coming in already with the mole, and you're saying, well, you've already got one. I can't do anything else. You've got it. Um, so, I mean, that's the situation with the volume thing. It's a difficult one. And I think your question, you're never going to please everyone in that situation. Because if you bring down the really loud ones to the ones that are, a, are more kind of say, sensible volume, and with greater dynamics, you're going to sort of piss off the producer who likes it loud, and, you know, if you bring the other one up, you're going to, you know, upset the other guy because you've squashed the hell out of his track and lost to his dynamics, and you're going to be unhappy in the middle. I don't know, there's no, that, that is a big problem, and I get it um, fairly regularly, you know, if I'm doing an album with different engineers, let's say, and one is really squashed and others aren't. I mean, you know, where, where do I sort of draw the line? I think you just have to go somewhere in the middle and, and you know, keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> but it's better, really, to, to bring the louder one down, I think, would be the, my solution. But not ridiculously, you know. So what is, what is it you're looking first for when you get a file delivered or...? Or start it this way. What's the best way to deliver your music to a mastering? Um, well, the best way to deliver it is to to bring it in yourself, really. If, I don't know if you mean that, but do you mean what sort of medium? Both of it. Yeah. Well, you so know, you, you I, think I think with you guys, with you guys, when you're if you're mastering your music at a mastering facility, it's best to go along. It always is because you know you can learn 
uh, hopefully if you're doing it right in, in the view of the mastering engineer. Um, if you respect their opinion, you know, they might give you ideas about what you're doing wrong, what they're doing within the mastering to correct it. Um, and you, know, you can go away and, and use that information on your next project, which uh, you know, is, is valuable. If you're not there in person, you're not going to know this. You, know, you just you hear the, the, the finished product and you, you don't know the, the thought process that's gone into that. Also, there may be things that you still don't like about it but couldn't be corrected because if you do this with the bass, it affects that with the vocal. So you know, it's a problem with your balance between bass and vocal. You need to sort it out of the mix, really, to, to solve the problem completely, and there's only so much you can do at mastering. But if you're not there to hear about both sides of the argument and the thought processes during the mastering, um, you're not really going to learn. So it, it's best to, to bring whatever format it's on in and attend. Um, but the other way of looking at it is, I think you possibly also mean sending things in via FTP, um, Data files we get. I mean, most of our work now is is, is data files by, uh, by analog, long. analog tape. It's, there's still some analog tape about. Um, it's only on bigger budget stuff, I would say, because it's it's damn expensive. You know, not only to buy the tape but to have a decent machine to record it and play it on. Um, so there's not. It's mostly data files, and it's it's mostly, I'd say, 24 bit, 44.1k files. Um, but it's, it's half inch is still, still the best one to me. I think on quite a few occasions we have clients come in and they've, um, they've burned two masters at once or they've, they've done a, a, an analog master and a data file at the same time, maybe 2496. Um, and you play the two together and, and most of the time the analog is just, it's just wider, it's just got a deeper sound, it's just bigger and more open. I mean the the data file is probably the more correct one, um, if, that's, if that's the right term. But the, the analog just adds a kind of a musicality and a space and a, a, a niceness to the music um, that, that normally wins when you compare the two, two formats. So you would recommend uh, buying tape machines? I, I would, and I've got some for sale at the moment, if um, anyone's interested. Okay, okay, no, normally, it, it, that's normally the way it works. Um, not always. I've, I had a project recently where they brought in quarter inch. Um, and it was quite funny because they said they wanted this lovely warm sort of sound to the album. In the end, we compared the, the quarter inch nice warm sound to the album with the data files, and it was all quite digital and thrashy. And in the end, we went with the digital one, which is, I don't know why. It wasn't what they originally wanted, but they did in the end. Um, but it did sound more present and more exciting than the analog. And for some projects, you know, that, that does work. Um, it depends, really, what music you're doing. I know in the past, um, I can't remember the name of the track now, it was a Ronnie Size track a few years back, and he tried to um, mix it on an SSL desk. You know, he spent a lot of money on it. And uh, the, the demo, or the original version, which had this lovely, exciting sound to it, a bit crunchy, a bit, a bit grungy and rough around the edges, um, it just sounded so much better than the one that was done on analog tape through the SSL desk. It all just kind of lost its, its edginess and its aggression. So, you know, horses for courses. Depends what you're doing. There's another question. Yeah, um, <coughs> somebody told me recently that they're stopping making tape. Is that true? Um, yes, that did happen for a while. That, I think Quantity are now making tape again. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'd, I'd like to do at some point is record into tape and then into Pro Tools so yeah. do that first. So, yeah, because I, I find, like, the sound, yeah. Yeah, you can. I'm yeah. sure I'm, it's now available again. There was a period yeah. for about six, nine months when there was, that's it, tape, analog tape didn't exist anymore, and the, which the, is a sad day. But. The other question I have is um, I've watched somebody master and I saw we had three tunes for referencing and swapping in between them. But I still really don't understand the difference between mixing and mastering. Like, can you like, uh, as I understand it, maybe you make the bottoms lower and the mids more mid and the highs higher, and there's more space for each sound. But I don't, I don't really understand exactly what it is. Um, <laughs> the, the difference between mixing and mastering. Yeah. Um, well, again, a mastering. I mean, you could look at it another way. I, I quite often, 
have people bring in Pro Tools into the mastering. They bring in their, their stems or whatever in the Pro Tools, not using any um, outboard gear, but just um, you know, playing straight out of the Pro Tools. And we actually, instead of mastering it, we're essentially mixing it. So they're very similar because if, I'm, if I was mastering it straight off a two-track stereo file, and I thought I was going to add some brightness, you know, bring up the hi-hats or whatever, um, because they weren't cutting through enough, then it's all I'd say is bring the hi-hats on, on the Pro Tools up, the stem, bring that up instead. So that, and in the end, most of the time, when we was mastering this Ronnie Size album, this was, um, it hardly touched the mastering equipment. You just kind of do it all in Pro Tools. Yeah. But, but that's all a lot of the time mastering is. It is kind of... Um, correcting um, imbalances, let's say, that, that have occurred in the mixing stage that it's too late to go back and change. If you, in an ideal world, you go back and, and have another tweak of the mix, but that's not always possible. So, you know, they, they are similar, but you, obviously you're, um, you're restricted what you can do at mastering compared to mixing. So, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 that's good. Okay. There's another question. Right behind you. How are you going again? Um, just uh, wondering also about like the whole MP3 phenomenon, and um, you know, obviously that is such a big thing and such low bit rates. Yeah. And I've heard now that mastering houses have actually started mastering for MP3s, like literally. How? What's the go with that? I mean, you know. Well, I don't know if you master for MP3. We certainly would start to do the conversions for MP3. Okay. Because but it's not. It's a, it's a funny thing, the old MP3 thing, because it seems that all of the, um, the digital aggregators or the sellers of these MP3 files, they create their own MP3 files from 1644 WAVs, for example, or just straight from a CD. I don't know what they're doing. But there doesn't seem to be any sort of consistency with creating these files. So and we've done an experiment recently where um, it, we had an MP3 file that was supposed to be 320 um, kilobits. But when we done the, our conversion, we brought it down to sort of lower than 128 to get it to sound how what they said was 320. So it wasn't. They're not doing the conversion well. Um, so increasingly, uh, mastering facilities, I think, I know we are, are, are doing the MP3 um, conversion ourselves just so that it's done as well as y it can be. Because I don't know what the process is when it goes off to one of these um, websites or whatever, I don't know how they do these conversions because they're not doing it very well. No, not yeah. all of them, yeah. some are better than others. Because I, I mean, I heard that uh, like guys like Timberland and whatever, um, I guess there's that whole ringtone phenomenon and there's this whole thing with that, and that's almost become more popular than the tunes to an extent. <laughs> yeah. So the way that they've written, you know, the way they've written the stuff is exactly in that kind of form for that format and EQ'd, and I guess because they know it's going to be so the the bit rate's going to be so reduced or low, then you know, as, as soon as that happens, it becomes toppy and harsh. So they're kind of mixing it to be shit quality, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, people have always you know, mixed tracks to sound good on the radio. Well, I thought that that's what they're doing. Then, you know, it makes absolute sense, doesn't it, to, to mix something to sound good on a phone, yeah. as crazy as that sounds. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how... True, that is that statement, though. Are you sure? Yeah, the well, people are really I am totally sure because I know. I mean, it was from he said it himself, it was on like YouTube or something, and it was just this whole thing, you yeah, know, bloody I'm what sure. is compromising the actual well, CD version, let's say, for yeah. the sake of the phone version. Well, mate, I think it's a whole nother, it's its own entity, and yeah, you know, the, so I guess it's yeah. that's his um, you know, another angle because yeah, it's sort of absolutely. another way to do it, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's de definitely. But I'll be surprised if people are actually thinking that's what you, how you master a track now. Your main format too, too is like a telephone. Program. Yeah, totally. Sod what it sounds like on the CD player. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I don't think we're there yet. We yeah. may get there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> not yet. And um, what, what, would you, what would you recommend uh, to people as we're living in the laptop age of uh, or plug in Fantasia land if you... Have your track finished? Yeah, do whatever you want. You know, yeah. go, go for it. Get your plugins in. But can I have the one with all the plugins? Have a have a real block. Yeah, I get it all the time. But thankfully, most of the time, I'll get the one that's been squashed to hell. Every sort of plugin put on it. Um, as long as I've got the one that hasn't got all that as well, I'm happy. Because I think it's it's quite interesting sometimes to see um, what a producer 
of a track comes up with on their own, you know, in their own studio, what plugins they'll put across it, how much they'll squash it, um, distort it. it. It does give me an idea of where they want to go with the track. And it, it, it kind of gives me almost, you know, a brief of where I want to go with the unmastered version. See if I can do it um, to the same sort of intensity or a, a similar kind of... Um, style to what they've done it, but see if I can bring something else into it that's not quite so crude, it just works a bit better. So, you know, plugins are fine, I think, and you can't ignore them and, and, and stop people doing their own mastering and doing their own kind of squashing and what have you, but, you know, let's have, let's have two versions and, you know, let's, let's compare them, because if there's only one version and it's um, been squashed, compressed, um, distorted, you can't undo it, you know, you can't sort of undistort, I've got a button that says, you know, get rid of the distortion, it's there and there's no going back. Once the milk is spilled. Then exactly. Yeah. And, um, yeah, speaking of comparisons, uh, you've brought some stuff along in the before? Yeah, these are quite sort of, you know, subtle-ish versions, I suppose, of, um, of stuff that I've done fairly recently that I, uh, that I like the tunes and I like what some, what some, you know, it's some good old-fashioned mastering has done, nothing brutal or anything, but I'll play you these just as a there's not one in there at the moment. Did you take your one out? Yeah. <coughs> you were just speaking of uh, you like the music. Do you, do you actually have to like the music you're a master really, um, to do a good job? Um, or is it like the surgeon who should never <laughs> operate his own kids? I think, I think you've got you to gotta like it technically. I think it's very disappointing as, for, as a mastering engineer when you put something on and you think... <sighs> You know, we call it turd polishing. Um, you're never going to make it shine. You know, it's um, it's not going to happen, and it's a bit discouraging. So it's important to like it technically. I think you, it's got to have good separation, good balance, um, um, a good dynamic frequency range, etc. Um, whether you emotionally like the track, whether it's a good song, I think can sometimes sort of be distracting from from getting on with your job because you're kind of excited just by the track itself. So therefore, you kind of, part of, part of my brain <laughs> switches off from um, the technical side of things, and maybe I get a little bit too carried away with just loving the track. So, I mean, you know, it's fairly subtle. I can't say that I can't master something that I like, but um, it, it helps if you're, you don't love the track. You know, if, you're, if your favourite ever artist walks in the room, I think it's, it's quite, quite difficult. I found out when Kylie Minogue walked in once. Yeah. Just went to jail. Kylie Minogue is your <laughs> favourite artist ever? Well, I don't know her favourite artist, but she, she's, she's a lovely girl. <laughs> Mine is Rick Astley. Yeah, well. Right. So, let's have a look. Yeah, so, um, what have I got? So this first one, I love this track. I, it's always in my head at the moment. It's Mark Evans, um, The Way You Love Me. It's been around for a little while, I guess. Um, but I mastered the album recently. And, um, well, this is what it came in like. Uh, sorry, I know that it, it depends on frequencies uh, and on uh, the tracks, but what kind of frequencies are, uh, were these that, that you had to take off in, in this track? The, the drum and bass track? Yeah, just curious. I'd, I'd normally, um, with the, uh, it, I think I'd use a Masalek EQ and about 60 hertz. I mean, 60 hertz seems to be quite a common theme with drum and bass in terms of where the greatest proportion of the, the weight of the bass is. Um, and it's good, you know, it's quite low down. It, it doesn't detract too much from the kick. So you still keep the punch, but the weight would come down. Does that answer? Do you, do you like all the um, it depends, really. It depends what the... Well, as a quick answer, I'd say no. I'd never cut all the sub frequencies. I'd only do that if they was out of control. I mean, below I mean, like thirty or. No, yeah. Well, again, if it's if it's out of control, if you can see the speaker cone doing this, and it's there's all sorts of DC going off. Because um, mm -hmm. the trouble is with the very low stuff, it uses up your amp and your speakers, use up so much energy producing that very low stuff. But quite often, if I put a 30 hertz roll off in, 12 so it's a good advice to, to cut. Yeah, the punchiness there. of the bass comes through. Mm -hmm. Everything seems to work a bit more effortlessly, and um, you know it sounds more controlled. Even though effectively you've taken more away, it seems to give you more. Mm -hmm. So I use uh, analog filters to do that quite a lot. 
but not sort of you know systematically. I wouldn't always do it, but it does work a lot of the time. And by the way, you think it's like um, uh, concerning mm, dynamics processing in the mix, like in order to get mastered, like you would recommend like not to compress too much on the on the drums and and voices or. Um, not well. It depends. Whatever it sounds good, you know. I, it's difficult, really, for, as a mastering engineer, to get involved with what you do within a mix. It's it's purely creative and artistic, I would say. But um, I wonder if if you deliver like um, um, very much compressed stuff on the mix, like you're you're already like you know losing like dynamics on. No, no, not in the whole mix. Just on the elements you're compressing in the mix. Like if you overdo that, yeah. Uh, like you're gonna you're gonna deliver something. It's quite squashed um, yeah. in the rhythm section, I, I mean. Yeah. I, again, it's, I mean, it's difficult to comment on that because every bit of music sort of suffers or, or benefits from different treatment. So if it works for that track, you know, it's just, just do it. But, um, you know, I can't be too sort of clear on that. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Can we What? get the microphone, please? Um, sorry, how much hertz did you say that the bass is the most punchy? About 60 hertz. 60 hertz. Yeah. So, um, what is like the, like another question, so what is like the essential thing that we could like let a track sound everywhere in the same way? Like, what would Gone. be the most essential thing for this? To make a track always sound the same? Yeah, like in a, um, car hi-fi or in a small thing or like in a, in a club so well the hardest thing to reproduce is bass end I mean if you if you control the bass end um, mm -hmm. you concentrate on the bass end and keeping it as controlled as possible and as easy to reproduce as possible so you, you steer clear of these six, 60 Hertz and below stuff um, that's your best bet you know I, I've come across many records that sound fantastic on a big system but mm -hmm. But so as, soon, as soon as you put it onto a small speaker, you know, the bass line is keyed so low in the mix that, that, uh -huh. um, that you can't even hear it. You know, it doesn't even reproduce on, on small near fields or headphones or whatever. Yeah. So I would say, you know, keep, keep the very loads very controlled. Um, you so know, should we cut down from six above? Or? Well, I'm not saying you sort of cut it out. Just yeah, don't even mix there in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. keep whatever you're thinking of putting to, to give the track weight. You know, tune it further up maybe or just... Mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 but it, you, know, you need big speakers to reproduce that low bass and, and tall rooms. Yeah. So, I mean, if you haven't got that, you, it varies so much from, from room to room or from car to car or whatever. So if you don't have that low bass, you concentrate on, on tuning the bass higher up in the mix, um, mm -hmm. just keeping it punchy, um, then you're more likely to have something that will reproduce uh, uniformly across you know, different sound systems. And say. how much would you say for the high end? Like, what H would how much what? Sorry. Like how much? Like about from how much? Like kilohertz sh should we take care of the what high what end? What roll off? Yeah. Um, it depends what you've got going on in the percussion end of the track, really. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I extreme highs. Uh, I'd, I'd keep to a, a minimal amount, um, especially if you're talking about cutting onto vinyl. Mm -hmm. Because you just, if you've got a hi hat pattern that's um, that's that's very narrow in bandwidth and it's very it's very sharp and it's sort of peaking up at sort of 14 k, mm -hmm. you know, you just can't. If it's if it's loud in the mix, um, you try and cut that. It's just going to distort if you're trying to cut at a high level. So you know, you might have to start rolling off the top end, the very high top end. But that's taking your hi hat pattern straight out of the mix. Okay. Whereas if you have the hi hat pattern you know, more sort of 8K or down there somewhere, so a bit more lo-fi, really, then it kind of is easier to reproduce, it's easier to cut, um, and it's going to work again more generally on, on several systems. Yeah. So just one more question. On yeah. Um, what about, like, for example, uh, is, that, is that true that you shouldn't have, like, any stereo bass line going on for a vinyl? Uh, Like yes and no. Exactly. I mean, it does. It, it's one of the big problems with cutting vinyl. You've got sibilance, which I'd say is the main problem, which is, mm -hmm. you know, S's on vocals that are, that are too extreme. They're not um, de-essed. 
because when you're trying to cut loud, it's the first thing that, that uh, uh, your record can't, or your tone arm, your stylus can't trace back. So it immediately distorts. It's not cutting it that's the problem, it's tracing it back. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's one thing, the first thing that has to be limited, the, the S's on the vocals. And the other thing with stereo bass, is what happens is when you're cutting a groove, if you're just cutting a mono groove, it would just be fixed depth. So if you looked at it down a microscope, the groove would always, always stay the same depth. It would just go from side to side um, to reproduce the various different frequencies. Um, when you introduce stereo, yeah, um, it's up and down. So you get what's called sausaging. So if it's a bass end, it's a very technical term. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, with a bass end, you get like large excursions if it was mono. But when it's stereo, you add in this sort of fattening and thinning at the same time. So, so the interface. groove goes from very fat or deep, I should say. You see it as fat, but it's actually going deep. It's a very thin. And then, of course, you get a chance of it coming out of the groove. So we use um, what's called an elliptical equaliser, uh, which you can select what frequency it works, starts to work at, um, depending on what you need to mono on the bass end, how severe the problem is. Um, and then that kind of keeps the groove at a more fixed depth um, so that you've got less chance of jumping. But it's what can happen is if you've got a great big stereo bass and you've got to mono it, you mono it and it kind of disappears to some degree. So it changes the balance within the mix. So if it's going on to vinyl and vinyl is a concern of yours and you want to get it loud, keep your bass end mono because otherwise you're going you're gonna to run into problems. Okay. And um, you just mentioned two terms, uh, de-essing, de-ess? Oh, sorry, was that de -essing, yeah. de -essing, and the other one was sib sib sibilance. Well, they're both the, so if they're someone both the same know what this to, do with the, they, to do with each other. So S's is, is, you know, on the vocals, um, which sounds unpleasant on CD. If, you, you know, if you're listening loud and something's particularly s um, you know, it's quite harsh on the ears. Um, that's called sibilance. And then... But it's okay on CD because CD can handle whatever <coughs> frequencies you throw at it. It will, it will deal with it up to 22K. Um, but when you're looking at um, vinyl, as I was saying, you can't, it can't trace it back again. So you use what's called a de-esser. And this works at limiting the, the higher frequencies within a track. So sometimes if you're trying to cut a track very loudly and it's got lots of sibilance in it or the vocal hasn't been de-essed properly or well enough, you have to use a de -esser. but because I'm dealing with the whole track, as I turn up the de to minimise the high end, hopefully it hits the vocal first, but quite often it will hit the hi-hat pattern or the snares or anything with high-end frequencies within it. Um, so you can run into problems that you kind of have to dull the whole track in order to get to the vocal to stop it distorting. And that's called de -essing. Okay. And um, you... The last we listened to was a drum and bass tune. Yeah. And there are quite a few drum and bass records that have your little signature in the run out groove, right? Yeah, thanks to you. So, do you actually, did you actually, or are you still going out to drum and bass parties to see how the music you're mastering is no, actually I'm working in an environment? Too, too old for drum and bass. Nah, parties. no one is too old for anything. <laughs> Nearly 40. <laughs> but, um, I mean, l my question is if, if you have to experience the music to to know how to deliver it well I, d I mean i don't i don't think so because i think i'm still doing it i think it still works i think i think i'm just pushing the format of vinyl as far as it can go it can't go any further at the moment without jumping um distorting too much although that's not normally an issue with drum and bass it's normally you know push it as loud as it can possibly go as long as it doesn't jump that's, it, it doesn't, you know, the distortion element is not so much of a factor. You know, it's kind of uh, an, an accepted idiosyncrasy of drum and bass, and it is with other dance um, records as well, but especially with drum and bass, just get it loud. Um, so, you know, I could go to a drum and bass club and stand there and feel old, but, uh, you know, I don't think it's really going to show me what else to do with a drum and bass record. I'm always just pushing it. I, I speak to enough people, I hear enough music, and... I, I still get feedback about what my mastering is like when it's played out. So I don't actually need to be there. And also, I found in the past, you know, it's very damaging to go to clubs. I know it sounds like a very old thing to say. Dam damaging for, for years. Yeah. I mean, you know, coming out of a club with ringing ears and having to go to work the next day and, and master someone's sort of 
classical sounding record with you know delicacy. I mean, it's just I, I, it's always unnerved me standing next and, to. And your ears are obviously your capital. Well, exactly. You know, and they're obviously important to me, and I'm sure yours are important to you. So you know, you need to protect them as much as possible. So I mean, I used to go clubbing four nights a week every week. I used to be bang into it. Used to love it, but um, you know, I, I think I got then the essence of what a track needs to do. And I used to go out with various DJs, and it would literally cut a plate, and I'd go to a club with them and hear it there and then. And you know, that was very valuable, a very valuable experience. But as I say, I think with vinyl now, there's um, there's nowhere else to go with it. With CD, you know, as we were saying earlier, there's, we're nearly at the limits of what that. Well, we are at the limits. There's nowhere else to go with that. It's been maxed out and pushed as much as possible. So uh, I don't know. I don't think I'd gain much at the moment. <coughs> but what would you um, prefer in a club then, if you would go vinyl or CD? I mean, this is like oh, the, in a club. the same old, same old question. Well, yeah, absolutely vinyl, without a doubt. I mean, the, the great thing about vinyl is that it's ear friendly. Um, the thing is with, with um, playing files in clubs is that quite often they're not mastered at all. Um, they may not even have ever been analog. So you've got this um, an enormous amount of energy in digits that there may be tons of energy in the very high top. And, and this sort of stuff at a very high level is extremely damaging for your ears. And not only damaging, it's unpleasant to listen to. Whereas a piece of vinyl... Even if it hasn't been mastered particularly well, at least it's kind of it's it's been rounded off. It's kind of it's not so hard on the ears. It's got a warm sound to it, and generally, it sounds sort of nicer to listen to. I don't like using the word nice, but um, you know what I mean. It's just unmastered digital files, MP3s, and and distorted this and distorted that. It's not it's not too nice, and also you get. Um, the, the, the huge differences between one person's version of their home mastering and another, so you get these huge changes in the sound. Um, yeah, so vinyl wins for me, definitely. And, and um, it's uh, I know it's not really what you would like to hear, but like, could you maybe just uh, give us some names for like what kind of software we could use for what home use, that? like? For home mastering, plugins. Yeah, like just yeah, just some plugins. Let's just a couple of names. I mean, what, what kind of compressor? What kind of limiter? So. Well, I, it's funny. I, I think Abbey Road do a mastering plugin. Mm -hmm. Abbey Road Studios. I, um, Maybe you can explain briefly what Abbey Road. Studios are. You, don't, you don't know Abbey Road Studios. I know, but so maybe <laughs> someone in there doesn't know. Abbey Road Studios is um, is a studio in West London, which is famous for the Beatles where they used to record all their stuff, um, owned by EMI. And uh, they have a mastering facility there. And I, th um, I, I mean, I've never used this plugin, but I, I, I'm sure it exists. I mean, I'd, I'd possibly give that a go, but I don't, I don't use plugins. Um, I, I've tried other plugins in the past, Oxford plugins. Um, I, I've tried L2 stuff, you know, all of these kind of limiting and, and level plugins, Waves, yeah. So um, was Waves, for example, like well, a company? Waves, yeah, I mean, you know, the Platinum Bundle or the newer version of that, but it, I, I use the hardware version because we've tried um, hardware versus software and it, it always wins um, for us. So I don't actually use plugins personally. I use a digital workstation, a Sadie, um, but I don't use plugins. So I wouldn't really be the best person to ask about it. But tr have a look, see what this Abbey Road one's like. I'm sure, you know, they know what they're doing down there. I'm sure they've thought about it and I've, I've come up with something quite good. So, you know, give that a go. All the Oxford plugins. There are some more questions. And for example, if I buy myself some kind of like TC Electronics finalizer for like home mastering, would it be uh, nicer than if I had some plugins? Would it say the last bit again, sir? Uh, do you know like TC Electronics finalizer? Uh, that, that piece of gear? Yeah, I've never used it, but yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Oh, TC. Yeah, TC. The fi yeah, I mean, I use the M6000 TC, um, which is, uh, I, I've never actually compared the software finalizer version with the hardware one, I don't know. No, I was talking about hardware, you know, a piece of hardware. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah great, go for it. I'm sure it'll sound good. But as I say, I use the M6000 one, which is uh, better for me. 
<laughs> but a lot more money, actually. I was just curious about the digital thing we were talking about earlier. Um, if you want to make a digital release, like, uh, what would you think of? Because I've never thought about it. I'll just let the distribution company contact the company that makes the MP3s and then send it to iTunes. Yeah. So I never thought about that, that there's no standard, you know? I know. I know. It's, 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 it's quite amazing. How, how do I know that they, they are doing a good job or not, basically? It's a good question. I, I, I'm not sure if I know the answer. You could do your own version uh, and, and present that to them and say, do this. But iTunes, they do the AAC compression. Um, I, I don't know. You could ask them. You could ask them how they're doing it. You know, can you present them with one that you've done yourself? Um, it's difficult. It's not something we do at mastering, um, like talk to the, the people at iTunes or, or, or Beatport or whatever and... and I mean, we deal more with the record labels and the producers. Um, but I, I would say that the best thing to do is to give them a file that's already in exactly in the format that they're going to put on their site. That would cut out as you know, much room for error on their front as possible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and when do you decide whether to cut a piece of vinyl at 33 or 45? Um, well, two things, really. I suppose one is, is preference. Some people just prefer 33 or 45. I mean, 45 is, captures much more of, uh, of the bit of music that you're cutting. Um, as, as a rough equation, I've done this experiment um, a couple of years ago. I cut um, this, uh, the same, uh, it was just a loop of a beat. Uh, the, there was a drum beat, so it had top, middle, and bass in it. Um, I ran it across at 33 and 45, and I put the two versions in the Sadie and, and sort of had a look at them both to see what they was doing. And uh, obviously the best quality was the outside of the 45 RPM cut. And it's what happens is as it goes in towards the middle, the top end slowly dives off, and it goes off quite drastically in the last kind of 25% of the disc in the middle. Um, but at about halfway across the 45 cut, the amount of top end that's been lost is, um, is roughly where you start at the outside of a 33 and a third cut. Does this make sense? Um, so that's the kind of what you're hearing. A lot of people think there's loads of myths about what you can cut louder on. Um, you can cut the same volume on both, in my opinion, and I've never been disproved about this. Um, you know, you can cut maximum volume about plus eight, plus nine VU um, on both formats. And it, there, then on both formats, 45 or 33, it starts to possibly jump if you're cutting a, a nice sort of slow attack drum and bass tune or something. Um, so the 45, I would say, is the choice to go with if you want a brighter cut. The 33 is the one you want to go with. You want something a bit more rounded sounding. The bass will come through a bit more because there's less top end on it. Um, so it's the, that's the, the taste difference between the, the two. Um, the other factors are that most DJs, I think, generally prefer 33 because it's easy to mix with. Is that true or just legend that actually the outside of the vinyl is better quality than the inside? Yeah, it's just what I was saying about the top yeah, end. Yeah, I didn't get it exactly. That's why yeah. I was asking. It's not... Yeah. It's not only to, you know, it's to do with the speed that it's travelling, um, yeah. which means you know, that all the grooves are essentially more spread out. They can um, track back the information of what's in the groove better. Also, as the tone arm swings in towards the middle of the record, um, obviously it's going a lot slower, and the, yeah, the, the okay. tracking That's error it. is wrong. It's sitting there. Okay. Everything. Oh, yeah. Got it. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> just like, <laughs> didn't want to waste your time. No, no, not at all. And um, you've, you've just been recognized um, a few minutes earlier uh, for being on a video, Talking Heads. Oh, Maybe gosh, yeah, this was some years ago, yeah. Explain that, what that was about. Well, this, that was a, um, a Metal Heads, um, I suppose it's kind of like a promotional video years ago, a documentary or something, They're talking to all the artists on the label, and um, they had a, a section of um, uh, what mastering is, and I was doing tons of metalhead stuff then. This was probably about eight years ago, I think. And uh, so a, a camera crew came down one day and they said they wanted to film me working. 
which I was, you know, fine about. And then uh, suddenly they brought in this, like, 10,000-watt bulb and stuck it in front of me, and I had a camera on me, and they started interviewing me. And that's what that was all about. I just appeared on this um, uh, documentary. It was funny, for the first time ever, I went to a screening. And, um, you know, it's a cinema this sort of size. It's obviously a great big screen. It's packed out with everyone from the drum and bass scene. And um, it was just terrifying for the first time ever seeing my face on this screen, sort of like 10 foot tall. And um, yeah, and that was, that was what that was. That was quite a time ago now. Okay, and you, you mentioned mastering studios that are not really mastering studios. So in your opinion, what does a mastering studio need? Or what do you have? Like uh, well, I didn't say they're not the necessarily master mastering studios. Yeah. They're just, um, what are they? They're, they're kind of, uh, I've got to put this delicately, I suppose, in some way. But they're cheaper alternatives. Um, fast food. A far, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very expensive to set to set up a, a very good listening environment. It costs a lot of money. I mean, the the, the monitors that we use at Metropolis and in nearly all the rooms, the PMCs we use, um, BB5 XBDs, getting technical. Um, I think they're about thirty thirty five grand for a stereo pair now. Um, you know, but it's. In order to reproduce or what you, you want to hear off the record, you, know, you need great big speakers, you need them uh, to be built well, to be set up in a good room that's acoustically treated. Um, and, you know, and that costs money. Uh, the, the equipment that I use, you know, the Sontec EQs, the Maslick EQs, Prism D2As, A to Ds, all this stuff is you know, top-end equipment and, it, and it, it, it costs a lot of money to, to, to buy and to set up. Um, so, I mean, that's the main difference between these other places that set up and they're cheaper. Um, they're just offering the same service, it's still mastering, um, but it's not on quite such a, um, a, a, a finite level, let's say. It, you know, it's a bit more sort of quick and cheap and cheerful. So, uh, can, I, can I ask a, a question? Where is it? Um, do you use um, like bad speakers when you're mastering as well? Because the producer that we have here has like terrible speakers like that you get in the worst van he's got like mediocre speakers and then he's got some really good ones and he flicks in between each one yeah to um check how it's going to sound you do you do that yeah i mean it, we've got the pmcs which i mean they don't they're, they're great speakers and it's not true i think a lot of people feel like when they come into the studio and they see these great big speakers that everything is going to sound good out of these great big speakers because it's you know it's, they're impressive and they're big um <laughs> But it's really not the case. I've brought in plenty of CDs from home, for example, and brought them into work, uh, into the studio, and, and felt like I knew these CDs inside out, put them up on, on the big speakers, and it just exposes every kind of weakness, strength, inadequacy within the mix. It doesn't necessarily make everything sound good. Um, it just exposes and shows you everything that's in the mix. Um, so obviously it's very important to have the, the, the big speakers that are reproducing all the frequencies. Um, but obviously most people, the vast majority of people, don't use this sort of monitoring. <coughs> so it's also important to know what's going on, home setups in the car, etc. So, I mean, I use a combination of the PMCs and the KRKs, um, the 3000s, which is a near, a near field. Um, in the past, I've also had Oritones as well, which are you know, pushing it a bit too far these days, I think. Um, but yeah, we'll flip between them. Um, it's very important that the two, if, you, if you're listening to more than one pair of monitors and you are flicking backs and forwards, that the tonal balance between the two sets of monitors is similar. Because I've had in the past where I've thought, oh, let's try some new near fields and you know, get something that's, that's new and exciting. Found speakers that I love. I mean, I like Proax speakers. I don't know if you've heard of them. I've had them at home. They're a very sort of exciting hi-fi speaker. Um, but they don't sort of match tonally what the PMCs are doing. So you put the near fields on and it sounds all bright and brashy and very exciting, um, but you'd flick back onto the PMCs and it'd sort of make them sound a bit dull and uh, sort of unexciting. I mean, they've got to be comparable in overall tonal quality. Um, so the ones I've got now, it's almost like sort of a mini-me version of the great big PMCs, just to get an idea of what you know, a bass end is doing on a, on a bass cone that's this big as opposed to this big. So yeah, so I switch between uh, different monitors. But you know, what, what you're going to take as being the one that overrules the other is another issue. I mean, do you make something always sound good on the smaller ones and, you know, not necessarily so good on the big ones or vice versa, or do you compromise between the two? I, I suppose, I don't know, I suppose it's 
like, because with that band we make CDs, so um, it would be more important to make it sound good on a bad speaker. But yeah. maybe with the vinyl, it's going to get played through good speakers generally. So. Yeah, yeah. But then most of the time, when you're cutting vinyl, you're doing it from a, a master digital file, which is going to be used on CD, which is maybe not going to be played in the club, so it's more for home use or downloads or whatever. Mm. So, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a myth. Nothing, no vinyl really gets cut these days purely analog. It's normally derived from the digital mastered version. Mm. So they're, you know, they're very closely linked these days. There's a, you know, there's, in, in fact, in fact, the vinyl is only a, something that's less of than the, what the digital format is. You know, when people say they prefer this, the better sound of vinyl is better. It, it can't possibly be because mm. ninety nine point nine percent of of um, uh, vinyl is cut from a digital CD mastered format, so it's just different. It, and they might prefer it. That's interesting as well. Do, is the is it true about like bass when you're listening to a vinyl? Is is the bass a better quality on a vinyl than digital? Well, I, it's the same answer really. It's, it's it's different, and it's probably exactly the same. As I say, most of the time, if I'm if I'm going to uh, mastering a dance record, I master it um, to sound good coming out of the speakers, and I'm going to capture that as, as a digital format. And then from that file, the WAV file, everything that I consider to be mastered, I'll then cut the vinyl. And I may have to do some additional um, roll offs or controlling of the bass end, maybe mono the bass end, what we were talking about before, or roll off some of the very high top just to get it to cut cleanly and to work. Um, but you know, it's not, it's not better, it's just, and it may be slightly more controlled, but it'll be less of what's going on on the, on the CD, in a way. Mm. But it just sounds different, and people kind of like the sound of it. But I don't think you could ever say that, that vinyl is, is better, or more information on the vinyl than on the CD. It's the other way around. It's just that it just sounds different off the vinyl, and quite a lot of people prefer that. And, uh, sorry? Here. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've got Talk a question. Talk about these things, because anyway, someone's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use multiband uh, compression al yeah. as as well? Yeah. And in dance music, when which uh, normally, which frequency uh, bands do you compress stronger? Uh, you know, it depends on the yeah. music, really. So I know it's yeah, a really but boring I'm answer, but like I suppose. I'm uh, I'm interested in drum, bass, and dubstep. So this yeah. kind of bass bass music. Yeah, I mean, multi. I don't use a lot of multiband compression on drum and bass or dubstep, though, and it's um, not really a lot of compression. Full stop. I think I use the L2 a lot, which is um, which kind of compresses and limits at the same time. I would say it's got that sort of sound to it. Um, but with drum and bass and, and dubstep, I just kind of push it quite in quite in quite a crude way, really, rather than doing something subtle with it and putting a nice compression across it. It's normally just a case of just pushing it hard into the A to Ds and letting it almost compress itself that way. So I don't really use multiband compression to do that. Um, in relation to what, what he said about the, um, the different type of speakers, and how do you relate your, your big and spready sound on your room with your nice, like, treated room to the real world sound? Like, do you make what type of, I mean, you, you, you switch speakers, but you say like KRKs, yeah. which are like pro speakers in some way, and it's just uh, yeah. the speakers, you know, to work, but, but how do you relate your sound like to the, um, to the boombox and all that? I mean, do you check something and, and yeah. what type of, you know, science do you apply to that? Well, on, your, on your mobile phone? Maybe? No, well, often, yeah, I play through a mobile phone as well, but I, I think that's part of what you're getting from a mastering engineer is just kind of that in instinctive knowledge of what will translate and what will work on other systems. Um, you know, when you put a bass end up on the big PMCs, you know, it, it might sound very impressive, but you just know that it's not really going to work on vinyl or in a club or... Uh, do, you do, you take, sorry, do you take into account, like, different acoustic situations? Of, of the well, not many. I mean, there's so many variables, it's hard to sort of do that. I, I think you've just got to take a kind of average in the middle. But, I mean, I know that the, the monitor environment I listen to with the big monitors, the PMCs, is, is pretty damn accurate, accurate and pretty flat. Um, 
and I have to use that as a kind of rule of thumb. If it sounds right in there and it sounds controlled and it's all kind of working well in there, then, um, you know, there's so many... It could sound so wrong in so many other environments, but I'm not really going to make it sound wrong in my environment so that it sounds right in that because it's just different everywhere. So you have to... Mastering facilities should have monitoring that's pretty flat, um, pretty correct, and, and you've just got to go with that. And everywhere else that's wrong is just wrong. You know, you shouldn't really compromise what you've got for them. They've got to sort out their act. I think you know what I mean. I have a question about the compression. Yeah. Because uh, you're the guy who have to treat all these uh, mistakes with the compression at the end of it. Yeah. Uh, and some say it's better to compress things uh, slightly at every step, like when you record, you compress, when you do a track, you compress, and that, then you put some some compressor over the, like the final record. And some doesn't compress at all at any stage, but then put the final compressor like to make it more thick and... Yeah. And w which one is, like, you'd say better? Well, I suppose really, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to do both and compare them. I, I mean, it's, it's hard to be definitive um, about that. I, I would say, uh, if I had to, to guess about it, that I don't particularly like getting tracks that are un completely uncompressed and uncontrolled. Um, and you kind of, the, the producer, engineer, whatever, just assumes, I will compress it at, at mastering. Um, because it, you know, it can change the balance of the mix again. It's better to get as close as you can uh, throughout all stages. And, and hopefully, by the time you get to mastering, you know, the, the compression's done. You know. it, but I've always felt uh, that if a track is mixed correctly, it shouldn't really need any compression at the last stage. It should all be, everything should be sitting correctly anyway. Um, you may want to compress it to get some additional volume in some way on whatever format you're putting it on. Um, so, I mean, in answer to your question, I would say, you know, compress it a little bit uh, through each stage just to keep it under control so you're not going to get a big difference right at the end and this might change the balance of the whole mix. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Um, uh, I missed the first couple of minutes. I don't know if you uh, said the name of some of the albums you've mastered and artists. Did you, did you mention that? That was my fault. Oh. <laughs> if I, if I had. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my biggest album to date, which I, uh, which I was up for a Grammy for la this year, which I didn't win, though, unfortunately, um, was the Amy Winehouse album, Back to Black, uh, which has been my su most successful um, mastering project. I mean, it's been amazing, really. That album's been in the UK, I think it was in the top 10 or top 20 for probably 18 months or so. I mean, it was a phenomenal album. Um, but it was nominated for six, six Grammys, and the one that I had a nomination in, which was the best album, um, she had won all five of the six uh, Grammys, and then the last one, which I was convinced she was going to win and just ready to get up and jump up and down, and she didn't win, unfortunately. Herbie Hancock pipped her at the post. Um, but, you know, I've uh, mastered plenty of other albums. Thankfully, none of them have been Grammy-nominated, though. So. Um, but, but she didn't turn up to uh, collect her Grammys, right? No, well, she was on a big video screen. Um, I think so she if she doesn't care, she can give you one uh, well, of yeah. the five? But <laughs> <Are they? laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, she had just been videoed, I think, doing something she shouldn't with some drugs in a flat somewhere, and it was all a bit of a scandal at the time, and she couldn't get a visa, and... I think at the last minute there was rumours that she was going to turn up, but yeah, she had a, a video screen um, performance at the Grammys. It was funny actually going to the Grammys because it was, I mean, it's great to go to because, it, it, I mean, it's, it's the big event and it's very exciting to be at, but it's, it's very controlled and a bit stiff, you know. It's not, it was it, coming back watching the Brit Awards, I don't know if you ever watched them, like a few months later, it just looked like a complete drunken party compared to the Grammys. <laughs> I mean, it was hilarious. Um, so, so you preferred the metalhead screening? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. Well, like, yeah, but she was the only... She was great to watch at the Grammys because you, you never quite know with Amy Winehouse what she's going to do. You know, she's one of those great artists that you're never sure if she's going to put on a great performance or sort of, you know, just stop mid-performance or not turn up or hit the wrong notes. I mean, she's quite interesting to watch, I find. Um, so great art demands craziness? It's what, sorry? Great art demands craziness. Oh, well, it does, yeah. She's 
certainly crazy. And, well, she's and getting so many headlines. I mean, you know, and she's never out of the headlines, is she? She's, maybe she's not crazy, but she's certainly um, uh, tabloid. Yellow, yellow press material. Yeah, I mean, they love it, don't they? I love it. And did she ever attend a mastering session then? Um, she was around. She done a lot of the recording at um, uh, uh, mixing, I should say, at Metropolis. Um, she would never kind of attend mastering. She would just turn up to do a vocal <laughs> bit, and, and and that would be it really. Um, but a lot of the time, you know, artists when it gets to that sort of level, it's normally always controlled at that stage by um, the producer, engineer, and record label. Um, more than an artist, um, but other artists, you know, there's other big artists out there that kind of want to produce the whole thing. Someone like George Michaels brings to mind. He'll want to attend the mastering, do the mixing, you know, do the whole thing. Um, but quite often it's just left up to producers, engineers and record labels. And we have another question. Oh, I was going to say, is there any other albums, any other stuff that we would know? And that's name? the only one I've done, right? <laughs> yeah. Good start. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, in the drum and bass world, for example, I think I've worked with a, a huge amount of brilliant acts out there. Um, uh, uh, Goldie, Ronnie Size, Fotec, um, Pendulum. Did you do the Timeless album then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, yeah. That was, God, that was, how many years ago was that now? How many uh, years ago was that? 1996, maybe? Yeah, I mean, that was, a, it probably was about then. 12 years ago, yeah. or 13. I mean, that was a very exciting time for drum and bass, wasn't it? All the majors were suddenly thinking, oh, this is the next it's big 21st thing. 21st century jumping soul on, music. Yeah, jumping on board. Um, but Timeless was a, a classic and kind of, um, I don't know, I don't know it's been replicated since, really. And it's sort of, yeah, well, yeah, I suppose, yeah, definitely. Two pages for Hero. And But there was another question, right? Sure, one about uh, Emmy. Uh, was it Mark, Mark Ranson, or was it the record company that asked you to do the mastering? Uh, it was the record company, Darker, so I've worked with a lot at Island Records. Um, I mastered the, the single, Rehab, when it, it, it first came out or came through from the album. Um, and, you know, I'm not really sure what went on behind the scenes, but they really loved what I did with the single. Mm. So, um, you know, I got to do the album. Um, which actually is, it reminds me, it's a good point um, when you guys are, you know, if you're going to go and try a mastering facility for the first time, it, it's, it's very good to sort of try one track, you know, send off. I mean, you can try even asking for a freebie um, to sort of button them up, say you've got a triple album in the pipeline and you're going to do a massive project with them and you just want to test master one track. Um, you know, quite often we do it. We do a, a free master, um, just so people can see, you know, what we can do. Um, I've had it in the past, you know, when uh, people with too much money have, have mastered in two or, two or three different places at once and just sort of pick which one they like the best. That's obviously a bit of a luxury, but <laughs> but you know, it's a good idea to just just try before you buy. Um, with our eye mastering as well, we do this online mastering um, where you pay a price per track, um, upload your files to our site. Um, you can choose the engineer to do it or not choose the engineer to do it, and it's cheaper if you don't choose the engineer because then it just goes to the first available engineer. Um, and you get a free, I'm doing a big plug now, aren't I? You get a, um, a free so revision. So you can actually do that? Um, from, like, say from Sweden, if I want to master it yeah, yeah, digitally through you guys. Yeah, I mean, we do this, um, it's been great. I was, telling you earlier, we, it's fantastic that the projects that this throws up because you get, it's like a lottery, you never know what you're going to get, you don't know what part of the world this, these projects come from. Mm. You know, one minute you can be doing something very urban and, and sort of from London, the next minute you're doing something from sort of, I don't know, the Middle East or something, you know, an Iranian record or something, you know. It, um, but quite often people will send one track to us like this. Um, and we'll master it, send it back. If, if they want to make a revision, you get one revision included in the price, um, and then you get it sent to you as a, a file that can be used for CD manufacturer. Um, but quite often we notice with that, you know, you'll get one file when you'll master it, and then an album will turn up the next week or, or whatever. So, you know, people out there are, are using this um, just to sort of dip their toe in the water, see what they like, and if, if an engineer works for them, because you know, a lot of engineers have got different experience in different areas and different sort of sounds of the music that they do. 
Um, so it's good to just you know try out a few first if you can. I know it's you know expensive, but as I say, it's always worth trying to get a, a freebie. It can be done. It depends if you catch them in the right mood or not. <laughs> try. So, and as we already were in the gossip corner, well, who was the worst person to ever attend a mastering <laughs> session? <laughs> the worst person. But you you don't have to. Name a no. name, but you can tell the story. Oh, it's no fun if I don't name names. Though. Then tell the name. <laughs> um, I think mastering. I think one. Well, the one. We had, it's funny. We had a, a couple of weeks a few years back when you probably saw the headlines of um, Kate Moss. Do you remember the cocaine scandal of her snorting cocaine in a studio? Do you remember that one? Yeah. Well, that was at Metropolis. It wasn't while she was mastering with me, though. <laughs> I wasn't chopping it out, but I didn't supply her either. I want to make that quite clear. <laughs> um, but we had that, we had that, and then literally a week later, we had Michael Jackson turn up, and um, he, he trying to throw a kid out of the window. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, I mean, he wasn't badly behaved. But he told it was funny. He was he came out of Dorchester, where he likes staying when he's in London, and um, uh, with a massive press pack outside, and. Um, he, he told them all that he was going to Metropolis. So we had this enormous pack, press pack turn up on our doorstep with a massive herd of fans and everything, and they swarmed into the car park, and he jumped on his car and did a dance. And I mean, it was hilarious. We'd <laughs> we was on the front page of all the tabloids for like, you know, two weeks in a row. Um, but I think, yeah, Kate Moss does it for the worst behaved, um, or certainly in terms of uh, tabloid interest. But I've had, I had a funny one years ago, I'll never forget it, with Shaking Stevens. Um, you may remember him. <laughs> well, actually, I think he's still doing stuff. Um, but he had, he had sent his driver at the time around um, to a few record shops to see if his, he could buy his records. And, um, and, and they was out of stock, so he couldn't buy his records. So he, got in a, he was getting himself in a terrible mood. And then his manager walked in. And he just had a complete tantrum, and he picked up all these half-inch tapes, and they're shaking Stevens, full denim from head to toe, collars turned up, the white shoes and the quiff, <laughs> shouting, bollocks, fuck you, and everything. His, his manager throwing the half-inch tapes across him at the room, and I'm standing there in the middle trying to master the record. And they both stormed out, and I was just left there with sort of shaking Stevens playing, not knowing what to do with myself. <laughs> um, but no, I've had all sorts of, you know drug taking, alcohol, you know, uh, all sorts. But it, I've got to admit, people are, I'd have to get more serious or better behaved, but, you know, it doesn't tend to happen so much these days. I think people are a bit more serious about it, maybe. They want a career. Yeah, maybe, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, there used to be lots of drugs and stuff going on in, in well, certainly from what I saw in mastering. Not me, of course, nothing yeah. ever be done. But, um, yeah, they used to... I used to chop them out. So, well, do you remember there was actually a mastering facility called Chop Em Out at one stage <laughs> um, because it was so rife, which was quite funny. But yeah, a bit. Those were the rock and roll days. Those were the days, yeah. <laughs> so, any more questions? Do you know what? It's funny. On the, on, the, on the car on the way here, did you say card? Card, yes. Yeah, I, I remember I'd forgotten them my cards, and I'm getting them sent now. But, but you they can won't be here till tomorrow. You can very easily Google Metropolis Mastering. Yeah, it's Metropolis Mastering in, in London. Or you bring in the cards tomorrow. I will be bringing in cards tomorrow. <laughs> then please give the men a very warm applause. Thank you.